Welcome to the PC Gaming Week Spot, your recap of the last seven days in PC video gaming. My name is Colin Mahern, and joining me this week, I'm effing sweating. It's like a swamp down there, I'm telling you. Mainly because I'm nervous about introducing this man, it's the one and only Mr. Matthew Castle. Hello, what was that reference? That reference was uh, the Brit Awards were on in the last week. And maybe you didn't see Lewis Capaldi, singer, songwriter, um, the, the Scottish man who writes these kind of heart wrenching breakup songs. But then his personality is that of a, a stand up comedian. A bit uh, of a ledge. Uh, he, is, he is a bit of a ledge, yeah. But, but, Proper bands. Uh, yeah, he went on stage and he introduced, or his, his opening shot was, Hello, Mother Effers. I'm, I'm censoring myself because YouTube gets a little bit cross if you swear in the first 90 seconds. Wait, he said that or you said that? He said that. Oh, right, okay. You didn't yeah. censor yourself. He said that about, I'm censoring myself because no. of YouTube. <laughs> Like that's a so, weird opening gamut sorry, for the Brit Awards. I'm I'm saying I'm right. censoring myself for the so video. You mixed it, sorry, you mixed in a quote from him and a quote from you, and then said it was. That's why I got confused. So yeah, Listen, yeah, no, that's, this that's is off to a great start. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, Lewis Capaldi, Brits. Um, but, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Matthew, grab your news crank and open your gob because I have some information <laughs> snacks for you. Nom, 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 Info nom, snacks nom, nom, for his gob. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's just get on to... Let's that was get on a very to... aggressive ordering of the opening of my news gob, or whatever it is we call it. I, I felt it was necessary. Let's just move on from Lewis just Capaldi. Just get that crank and open your goddamn mouth, you freak. We, we, we might... We, we might... I don't know. His, do you know, his... Is it his uncle? Is, um... Because I'm getting the sense you're not overly familiar with the works of Lewis Capaldi, but you would be familiar with his... I think it's his uncle... Uh, what's his Not name? Peter. 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 No. Yeah. Peter Capaldi is his uncle. Mm-hmm. There you go. No, no, I found the bridge. Bridge that gap. I wonder. <laughs> anyone smell nepotism? Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, but now we can talk about video game I news. I wish if my uncle was Lewis, uh, was Peter Capaldi, I would also be a, a pop star at the Brits. If it was Lewis Capaldi, that would be very impressive. Uh, but yes, video game news. Uh, the dream, Matthew, the dream of having all of the big media briefings, press conferences in June is dead because EA have said that they're going to be holding their EA play thing on July 22nd. Ugh. And also it just seems like it's spreading out again because that, do you remember the Gorilla Collective, which oh, the yeah, first yeah. one was last year, was this mishmash of... Not even just indie developers. I think it was just... They were like 15-hour kind of a... streams as well, the Gorilla Collective ones. They were so long. Well, look forward to two this year, as there'll be one <laughs> happening on the f- Saturday the 5th of June and one on the Saturday the 12th of June. And they'll end at E3 2022. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, I, I think... When we're back in a in a world where people can go to these conventions and we're back in physical spaces, that's when things may be less spread out. But as it stands, and I uh, I must admit, like the one good bit of being made redundant from our PS is that like I don't have to follow all that for my job because all the the fragmenting of the streams. I know we've talked about this before. I've, it's very, very tiresome. Mm. It just oh. feels like instead of one good show, you get sort of five half-baked shows and you have to watch all of them to kind of piece together the whole picture. It, totally, yeah. You get, well, you, you get five half-baked and five other ones that are just rubbish. And then you get, last year, uh, RPS's Indies Uncovered, which was amazing, obviously. Quality, quality that's, stuff. Th- that's there. the exception to the rule. Indeed. <laughs> Uh, and it was exceptional. Uh, but yes, it was. Uh, do you know what else is exceptional to some people? Is Gears, Gears of War, the shooty men. Well, uh, developer of the Coalition, a developer of Gears of War, 
they put up a blog post on their website stating that they're switching development from Unreal Engine 4 to Unreal Engine 5. And the important part of this is that they also said, quote, shifting to a new engine is a big undertaking. So we want to be clear that we will not be announcing any new projects or titles for some time. Uh, just a little side note on the coalition as well. There was a rumour going around that they were making a Star Wars game and like to the point where speculation was on Reddit and whatever and a community manager Ooh. or something had to go on Reddit and be like, stop, stop it. We're not doing this, all right? Where did that come from? I don't know. I don't know. One of the rumour gobs. Uh, yeah, we don't care about rumour gobs. One of the rumour gobs, gobs of the internet that just, <laughs> just gob out rumours the whole Fact- time. Factual gobs only, please. Uh, but yes, uh, Matthew... If you, speak- if you spout enough rumours, eventually you'll be right about something. Correct. Correct, yeah. Uh, speak, we'll actually talk about maybe something like that in a minute. But Matthew, remember... Uh, Skull and Bones, the game that had the oh, yeah. Assassin's Creed naval warfare. Yeah. It was that was the game essentially. Uh, it was meant to be out in late 2018, and then 2019, and then March 2020, and then between April 2021 and March 2022. Well, it's been delayed again. Uh, Ubisoft have said it will now come out between April 2022 yeah. and March 2023. Jesus, I mean that naval combat in Assassin's Creed. It's fine, but also it's like must be coming up on ten years old now. Like the core fundamentals of it, like Black Flag. Surely that's Black Flag is never ten years old, is this? When uh, was when did PlayStation Four come out? Because that was a launch. Twenty twenty thirteen. Around... Yeah, so next year will be no. Okay, eight years ago, but that's still that's a long that's a long ass time for this this thing that's been doing the rounds. Um, I remember being at E three. And um, having a bit of food with uh, the Rare team. And this was the year after they, they'd announced Sea of Thieves the year before. This was the second showing of it at E3. And then Ubisoft had just announced Skull and Bones. And they were a little bit like, oh, shit. You know, right. Skull and Bones kind yeah. of like, oh, the, the, the pirate scene is a little more cluttered than we thought. Um, and they just needn't have worried because... Ubisoft sort of bodged it and it's just t- time and time again it's been I mean they've like... had that and that's quite I mean even for them I mean that's it's not beyond good and evil too but it's close yeah I mean it's... I mean how good can it be I just I don't know I feel like I've seen everything I needed to see with the boat combat in multiple Assassin's Creed no yeah like it's been in a like few it was now in, it was in the Odyssey wasn't it as well yep. had the, had the, but, and it was fine but like Not to the point where, oh, I need to play a whole game again of this online. I don't know. Yeah. uh, Speaking of games that aren't fine, uh, WWE 2K22, I shouldn't say that, WWE 2K22 might be fine. It was the last one that was rubbish. Uh, But in an effort to be transparent, I suppose, and to show people that, look, this game is indeed fine. Uh, Developer Visual Concepts have committed to regular development updates uh, in a, a, a kind of an opening shot, creative director Lionel Jinx said, "Quote: We're going to hold. We're going to be holding your hand through the process of how we make WWE 2K22 because it hits different, y'all. It really would want to hit different because, yeah, like that. I mean, they took the break, so at least there was uh that twelve months of a palate cleanser, I suppose, between." the memory Ooh. of the buggy WWE game, and hopefully this one, which will be at least competent. Um, mm. You know, we will see. Uh, speaking of a developer that makes competent games, very good games, in fact, uh, Remedy Entertainment, their CEO, Tero Vertala, spoke to IGN recently and said that they have a new game in, quote, very, very early stages. And this one is a different game to any of the ones they've mentioned before. So, like, they're doing the two Crossfires, they're doing the two with Epic, and they're doing a free-to-play co-op game called Vanguard. So Mm. Remedy have six games on the go at the minute. It's quite a lot of games. It's quite a lot of games, Which of those is is meant to be Alan Wake 2? Is that one of the Epic ones? That's one of the Epic ones, yeah. Yeah, Mm. so... uh, Yeah, it was like... 
the the two epic ones were like a big triple A whatever and kind of a smaller game. So like Ooh. Alan Wake two and Alan Wake's American Nightmare two. I uh I started um playing Alan Wake again the other day um because it's leaving Game Pass soon. So I thought I'd give it a little go on PC. If you're playing Weak Spot Bingo, yes, I mentioned Game Pass. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, that's a fun game. That holds up. Oh, good vibes. I, I'm glad you say that. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Like the set, I, I haven't played it since it originally came out. And um, yeah, like the whole setting of it, very cinematic. I, I think the balance of like the action and the more kind of story led bits is is strong. Probably like the strongest sort of iteration of that they've they've done the combat's more fun than i remember it as well like shining, it's quite shining the torch and the yeah and then the there's the explodes and, and there's lots mm. of fun sort of slow-mo and sparks and particle effects it's neat yeah no the, the, the worst thing about alan wake is the end the end is putrid because you, because you want to carry on playing uh, that too but also the bit where you know if somebody, you know, go on Game Pass and play Alan Wake. It's good. I won't spoil the ending. Uh, another yeah, I need thing, to. Sounds like someone else already did. <laughs> uh, another. <sighs> another <laughs> Come on. Uh, but yes, Alan Wake is a super game. And another super game is going to be coming from Sega. Oh, this story. This is so, this quote is just, it's the flimsy vaguest thing I've ever heard. I love the idea of just a super game. Uh, so this is according to a slide that was in Sega's latest earnings report. It's just said to be a new game, a new first person shooter from a European studio. But what, That'll be Creative Assembly, right? What do you would imagine, yeah. Uh, what, what does super game math? What, 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 what does Oh, they're making a super game. I mean, all games are meant to be super, like, good. Yeah. A super game. Superman? Like, super Sonic? A Super Sonic first-person shooter? Super Sonic Racing. A super Sonic, maybe? The Gallagher? A super game. I mean, you. I, I just like the idea that, like, other games aren't super. <laughs> It's like we're making a super game in Europe. All other games, not not so super. They, like they're fine, but they won't be super games. <laughs> um, I I don't think there's any like cryptic clue in this. I don't think it's like Superman, you know. Or yeah, yeah. Like no, that. it's 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 not. This is purely I think it's for just a weird. <laughs> someone's like, oh shit, I've got a presentation in five minutes, and they're on PowerPoint. How do I? And like, how do I? Uh, how do I make this sound big? Uh, 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 making a, a super game. Uh, and you'll have to wait and see how it's going to be. I think I've done that in meetings before where you're like, oh, yeah, we're going to relaunch the YouTube channel and uh, we're going to have these um, amazing, three amazing series that we're going to launch. Uh, and that would be the talking point. Uh, would you call them super series, Matthew? Yes, I would. Yeah, I would well, call so them we're super gonna have series. Some super content strands that you're really <laughs> going to like. <laughs> uh, now it's time for another mention of Xbox Game Pass uh, because oh, nice double bingo. Uh, following on from the announcement that Knockout City would be launching on Game Pass EA have also confirmed that Knockout City their dodgeball game is going to be free to play for its first 10 days so like again Good news I, for all those Knockout City fans I don't know why this isn't free to play like the fact that they're charging for this seems totally misguided and it does seem like they're trying to walk that back a little bit by you know it's part of game pass you can play it f- for for 10 days like maybe that'll work out get, for them get everyone hooked it's a bit like so we've been re-watching the wire recently so i think a, a lot in terms of like the baltimore drug trade of course and, you know a, a classic business strategy there um especially in the low rises is to give out a lot of uh, is to give everyone a free yellow top in the morning and get them hooked on the red tops. Then you get them hooked. Then the fiends come back for more, and that's when you get them. Get, but, get them on um, the yellow tops, red tops, WMDs. Like this, it's the strategy. That's that's the key. That that is, I and mean, it's it's good business thinking. I, I like the idea that EA have watched the wire and said, "What is our free yellow top?" And it's a ten day free trial of Knockout City. Um, <laughs> Knockout Matt. City would be a good a good uh, drug brand. 
I would. We got that knockout city. We got that <laughs> knockout city. And people are like, mm, nice. And you're like, wait, is that the drug or the, <laughs> the dodgeball game? And you're like, I'm afraid it's the dodgeball game. Just open their cords and it's just loads of cords for knockout city. What any knockout city? What about some rocket arena? Anyone? <laughs> Have you have you got any hyperscape on you? Um, <laughs> oh my so, god, that sounds that sounds like a drug from cyberpunk. <laughs> um, These hyperheads <laughs> on their hyperscape. Uh, Matthew, I mentioned this earlier about you know rumors and leaking and whatever else. Well, the the man, the games leaker himself, Jeff Grubb. Oh, recently, here he comes, <laughs> leaking all over the place. Recently went on a live stream and said, quote, Starfield is exclusive to Xbox and PC, period. This is me confirming that. He also added that he expects it to show up at E3 this year, and he said it'll likely be out in 2022. And all that scans for me, you know, like the... Uh, we've spoken about Bethesda like it doesn't really affect us I suppose like uh, whatever Bethesda do is going to be coming to PC uh, so that's good um, mm. hmm. but when it comes to like if you're Xbox you want to protect your acquisition and you're going to say well yeah you can have Elder Scrolls because that's always been on PlayStation or you can have maybe if there was a new Prey or a new Dishonored perhaps or whatever else but like new I Starfield don't know. I put- I would only keep something if I knew it was like a knockout, like 10 a out knockout of 10. A knockout city, 10 out of 10? <laughs> I wouldn't like, you can sit, the thing is, you can sit on a Starfield by all means, but it does have to be amazing because otherwise, like all the PlayStation fans would just be dunking on it because it's bad. Mm. Like, you give, you give everyone the bad stuff, keep the really good stuff. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm <laughs> sure it'll be fine. I tell you what, if I was Xbox, the confidence of this quote, like, I am confirming this, like, I am an official source when they're not. I would now put that game onto PS5 just to spite Jeff Grubb. Just be like, you cocky motherfucker, I'm putting it on PS5 just so that you are now wrong. But that is why I'm not in charge of games companies, because I am incredibly... Um, spiteful. <laughs> spiteful <laughs> and churlish. <laughs> and that is not a good foundation for business. Uh, so those are your information snacks for this week. So let's get on to some other hot, hot news. Go I'm on, confirming confirm. that Sega have a super game. It is a super game. I am confirming it right now. Oh, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> How exciting. Hello, I'm Hugh Edwards. Working in news... Is exciting. Yes, Headlines and Hot Takes is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we take you through some of the bigger stories of the past week. And quite a bitty week, Matthew. You know, a lot of information snacks. Uh, mm. But there was one story that I did want to talk about, and it involves the people behind that pirate game, Skull and Bones, and it is Ubisoft. Because... Uh, you know, it's that time of the year where there's a lot of earnings reports and uh, investor calls and all that stuff. And in a recent investor call, Chief Financial Officer Frederick, I'm going to go with Duguay uh, of Ubisoft, he said that Ubisoft is going to be focusing more on, quote, high-end free-to-play games. He said that the company's focus on releasing three to four premium games every year, quote, is no longer a proper indication of Ubisoft's value creation dynamics. Um, He added that uh, Ubisoft see free-to-play as an opportunity to, quote, meaningfully expand the audience of our biggest franchises. We've taken the time to learn from what we did last year with Hyperscape. We're also learning with the launch uh, with the launch we'll be making on Roller Champions. We've been learning a lot with Brawlhalla. That is rapidly growing and we think it is now the time to come with f- high quality free to play games across all our biggest franchises across all platforms. Mm. Now there was, this caused a bit of a stir. So they did have to clarify the following day because people were like, they're cancelling Assassin's Creed! But Ubisoft <laughs> said, quote, our intention is to deliver a diverse lineup of games that players will love across all platforms. We are excited to be investing more in free-to-play experiences. However, 
we want to clarify that this does not mean reducing our AAA offering. Then they went on to say, you know, we have Far Cry, we have Rainbow Six, we have Riders Republic and Skull and Bones, but to name a few. Mm. I mean, do you, th- I suppose this is kind of a more of a wider conversation about the viability in 2021 of an Assassin's Creed, a Far Cry versus, say, a Warzone. Because when you do, like, when you look at Ubisoft, they don't have a war zone like Activision. They don't have an Ooh. Apex like EA. I know, a Fortnite like Epic or Rocket. I mean, for, Epic have loads. Um, so like, They don't have a knockout city. They don't have a knockout Well, who does, really, apart from EA? So, like, I, I don't know. Like, yes, Matthew, the viability of... Your Far Cry's, your Assassin's Creeds in 2021. Discuss. I that, I, yeah, I, I think they're they're still perfectly viable. Um, you know, I think there's a big audience for them. I think what this is recognizing is that there are now lots of people who are pretty much exclusively like free to play gamers. You know, there are people who get served enough stuff by, you know, your Fortnite, your Warzone. There, there are you know they they play that one thing, and so trying to build that one thing makes perfect sense mm-hmm. they're kind of impossible to predict and make i think you know like they're lots of different things have been tried like you can see from what they kind of have in the works that they're looking in you know different directions they're you know they're trying to do the you know the hyperscape i guess is the i don't know what that would be closest to i suppose well, well it's because so, you're you know your shooter like um but it's is not it, is it Valor- out- Valorant-y? Yeah, like- it's not an out-and-out out battle royale. Um, you know, in their roller skating game, they're trying to go for the Rocket League um, spot. A lot of people seem to be doing that, weirdly. I think a lot of these weird, colourful, uh, cartoony sports games, from like Knockout City is another... Oh, it's 100% right. Yeah, that's Rocket, Rocket League. Rocket League wannabe. But it's interesting that, like, quietly you know all the noises around battle royale but i think a lot of people have their eye on them them secret rocket league uh gold stashes mm-hmm. um yeah i mean i guess it's sort of tricky for them in terms of like the straight up battle royale in terms of they don't have a like a big first person shooter franchise that naturally translates so i suppose it no better time to mention this than no uh so I, I I don't, if you're watching the video version, I don't want a footage to show of this, um, mainly because a lot of it has been taken down, but some of it is around and I don't know, I don't want that heat. Uh, so I'm not showing any of it, but yes. Um, Sometimes you've got to run away from the stash. That is something else the wire taught me. Um, Heartland, which is the Tom Clancy division thing, uh, right. the, the free to play thing. Um, over the weekend, some footage of that leaked, like a 20 oh minute demo or something like that. And that like that is free to play. And that yeah. has the name recognition of the division, which is what um what's his chops here? Duguay was on about. Like so, but, is, but, that, is that is that a first person thing or is it still third person like division? So from the footage, it's still third person. Right. And looking at reports, it appears to be like PvEVP. So it's it kind of just looks like the division. Like it's not Battle right. Royale, it's not not whatever. Um so yeah, I I, I don't know. But I, I don't like they I feel like they tried multiplayer with Assassin's Creed and it didn't it didn't work. Oh, but that was different. That was like that was like old school multiplayer though. I mean it was good, it was good. I actually I did like the multiplayer mode in Assassin's Creed, but that's like like uh, late noughties thinking, you know, where like every game had to have a multiplayer mode and some of them are good, some of them weren't, but none of them really stuck. But everyone felt like, I, I guess because it was like the, you know, trying to fight the kind of pre-owned scourge at the time mm-hmm. that, you know, the, the the logic was you had to have a multiplayer mode so people didn't just hand the game back in and then you lost all those, those other sales. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, I sort of feel like we're past that a bit. You know, I think people can confidently not many people do bet big on single player, but I think you can, you know, we, we don't see as many like crammed in modes, you know, like I, I always come back in my head to like Jedi Fallen Order, for example, 
as like the model of what can work. And, you know, that's that's just pretty straight. I mean, admittedly, it had the, the might of Star Wars behind it. So that's, you know, it's, it's not. That like, does help. Yeah. Yeah, it helps a little bit. People kind of like Star Wars. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like, so I thought Valhalla was absolutely massive. Like it was as big as anything that, you know, I thought they were sort of shouting about it being as good a launch as they've had. Um, like, uh, and I think that's why they came out and, you know, clarified, we're not cancelling all the single player games, don't worry. But I'm just, I'm not entirely sure when you look at their catalogue, like it's, it's, it's a lot of it is down to the fact that they say, you know, uh, whatever it was about uh, having free to play games using our existing um, uh, properties. Mm. Like, yeah. I- I don't know. I, I, I mean, that makes sense. Like, you know, some sort of brand recognition, you know, jumping in, you already kind of know what you're going to get. Um, you, and you can launch this stuff completely afresh. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. That's the mad thing with Fortnite. You know, Fortnite is a, before the Battle Royale mode, remember, is a, an actual failed game. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a thing they've I launched people. I- I I remember, uh, yeah, I remember code being sent in. And I was like, I'll give it a go. I was like, yeah, it's oh, horde mode zombie thing. Nah, whatever. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll never you know, think that, of this that, again. That goes to show that actually, the right, the right, you know, the right mode can can succeed even in something which is already, you know, failed. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't necessarily need the Far Cry thing, I and mean, it's it's a bit hard. I don't know. I maybe, maybe it just speaks to quite it. Like that hyperscape has made zero impact on me. Um, it's, it's made but, zero impact on anyone, Matthew, but that might just be the, like, I don't know if that's necessarily like, it's impossible to launch something without, uh, you know, a recognized kind of trappings to it. It's more that the trappings there were not particularly interesting. You know, I think it's possible to come out, you know, all guns firing with like an amazing roster of characters that people instantly take to. Like you can overwatch it, basically, where yeah. everyone's just like goes for like, interest goes from like naught to 60 incredibly quickly. Um, but no, it, uh, agreed. Like I know. I don't know. It's just it's, it's impossible to make any generalizations about this because everyone what works for everyone is completely different. Mm-hmm. Um I'd say Ubisoft, though, are like the last people I'd worry about, like their single player offerings. Like they make loads of them. Like they, they, just, they are so much more productive than, than like the other big publishers like them. Yeah. 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 Like if you compare them to your EA Activision. Yeah. I think the fatigue we feel around some Ubisoft ideas speaks more to the fact that they do make so many games compared to other people. You know, you look at Activision, who basically every month seem to sort of not shutter a studio, but turn a studio into just another content pipeline for Call of Duty. And you're like, well, that's another chunk of stuff we're not getting. You know, like with the Tony Hawk stuff, you're like, well, that's no more Tony Hawk stuff we're getting. You know, they're getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, I I wouldn't have those fears with Ubisoft at the moment. I mean, they're massive. They're designed to make massive stuff at speed as well because they've got that just huge, like, international sort of factory mentality. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's ludicrous, the amount of in-house. It seems <laughs> like, yeah, every other week you discover of a, like, yeah, Ubisoft Sheffield, and you're like, what? Oh, and that's, that's like, stuff. I was playing, well, I'll talk about it later, I was playing that Assassin's Creed DLC, and that's, like, more substantial than some games in their entirety, like, mm-hmm. just in itself. And you're like, this is preposterous, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that they're able to do this. Totally, totally. Uh, yeah, so don't worry. Your single player games probably aren't going away. And maybe Ubisoft will make, I don't know, Heartland might turn out to be absolutely incredible. Who Division, Division 2 is really good, I think. Uh, like, I found it quite, yeah. I mean, I thought, I I, 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 I thought it was a very competent yet boring uh, game. But again, at the same time, I recognise mm. it's not for me. It's, you know... It, it is for people who enjoy the like that destiny style loop, which is why. Yeah, the- but I was, yeah, I was just playing something co with Catherine when it came out, and it was fun. You know, we had, we had a, a, a really good time with it. Fair, yeah. That that is an important caveat to make. Like, uh, kind of pulling pulling, it's keeping it on Ubisoft. Like uh, the division. What was the other one? The 
oh, it's, it's gone. Breakpoint, Ghost Recon. I, that's another game where like playing solo versus playing co-op just worlds apart of oh, yeah, uh, just experiences. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, these are games more as like a space to hang out with your pal, you know. It's, yeah. it's kind of background noise for you to chat. Yeah, and it it becomes yeah exactly it becomes a much better game then. Uh, but Matthew, that's enough game chat. I want to know about the technology behind those games because yes, it is time for a lovely bit of tech mm. corner. And this week, it's all about virtual reality. HTC have announced the Vive Pro Two, which is the successor to the twenty eighteen Vive. It has a 5K resolution display. It's 120 degree field of view, 120 hertz panel. The goggles themselves are going to set you back £719 when this one comes out. Blimey. And the full kit, the headset, the controllers, the little boxes you place around your room, that's coming on the 4th of August. And that's going to cost you £1,299. It really looks like some torture device from Saw, doesn't it? Oh, it's going to snap in 60 seconds. It's going to crush your Ooh, head. Snobs and think, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so my question to you, Matthew, is what is the best thing that you can think of that cost you between £719 and £1,299? Oh, man. Have I ever spent that much money in all my life? Um, Car insurance. Uh, something that's been expensive. We've got, uh, uh, I guess, I think our bed was, ex- was, was probably roughly there. We bought a nice bed because, you know, you spend so much time in bed, don't you? That you, you want it to be a good bed. Um, yep. So we bought a nice bed. Um, it's not the most exciting story. Oh, you know, it's not like, I, so I haven't bought like a statue of Sonic or some kind of like. But, but, but you know what? I, I appreciate it's, it's an honest story and that's all I want. That's all I want. Yeah, S- I mean, sincerity. a bit of furniture. I mean, it's middle-aged, but there you go. That's life. What about you? Um, I mean, not a bed. The most expensive thing between 700 and 1299 uh, a, a PC, <laughs> probably, would be at the higher oh. end of that. Yeah, actually, that makes, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, but... You know, not a bed. I've never, have I ever bought a bed in my life? I don't think I have. Wow. I can't wait though. I'm really looking forward to it. You know, you go into the furniture shop, you get to lie down on all the beds. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's nice. Get that memory foam, you know? Yeah, get your Eve mattress. Oh, yes. Not sponsored by them. Um, No. (laughs) The other mattresses are available. Indeed. Uh, But yes, those are your headlines and hot takes for this week. So now, I have a crazy idea, a wild idea, Matthew. Let's talk about the games that we've been playing over the last seven days. Show and tell, show and tell, we can't afford a proper jingle. Jingle. It's meant to be jingle. Yes, show and tell is the part of the Piece of Gaming Week spot where we tell you about the games that we have indeed been playing over the last week. And my oh my... We have played quite a lot in the last seven days. And the first game that I would like to tell you about, Matthew, is, I mean, I suppose it's the biggest game this week, even though it's an old game, but Mass Effect Legendary Edition. Oh my God, look at your, look at your um, shepherd. My shepherd, I, (laughs) well, I modelled him after David Suchet. Oh, well, of course. (laughs) <laughs> because, because yeah what else are you going to do and I'm actually quite impressed I'm quite happy with him to, to be honest It may, I can't wait to have sex with loads of aliens as Hercule Poirot I'm really looking yeah. forward to it but uh, so yeah I've played about 8 hours of Mass Effect the original Mass Effect because I've seen people share clips online and stuff on Saturday night, and I was like, do you know what? I'll get, I'll get a month of that EA Play Pro uh, yeah. Plus or whatever it's called, and I'll give this a go and uh, yeah. see what it's like. And like, I mean, people. some people have had problems at launch. Like, for example, the graphical options on PC are very limited. I mean, 
regular listeners and viewers will be aware, I'm not one to mess around with uh, <laughs> graphical, graphical options too much. But I might tweak a few things, you know, if my PC is struggling or I think I can get a little bit more out of one or two things. Mm. Like some games go into granular detail, like uh, Resident Evil Village being a recent one, which is, I mean, the level of detail in that is ludicrous. But yeah, this one is pretty poor. It's resolution, frame rate, and one or two other things. But uh, for aliens, the- yes or no? Do you want aliens in this game? Quantity of alien, uh, like, but for those who want to tinker around with it, I I get why you'd be bothered with the lack of customization here. Like, it, it feels like a console experience first, right? Yeah, oh yeah. One one thing I did go into the graphical settings to see if I could tinker with was a field of view slider. That would have really been appreciated because when you pull out your gun, it's, I don't know, it's proper claustrophobic. Like the camera's right up against your back. But mm. thankfully, the PC community have answered the call of others and someone's made a mod already for you to, to increase the, the field of view. Some people had like issues with mouse sensitivity. The game, in, it plays... Uh, in ultra wide, but the cutscenes are sixteen nine. If you're on an ultra wide monitor, mm-hmm. some have some have been finding bugs. Like I went on R slash Mass Effect over the weekend to see, and it's not cyberpunk buggy or anything like that. But some people have had uh, some things that have hindered their progress. Like deputy editor Alice Bell said, this was pre release. Now uh, right. she said that w- whilst in com- some combat sequences, she just outright couldn't fire her guns. Uh, just, that- sometimes. I, I went to one planet and there were these huge bugs everywhere um, called the Rachni. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> but, right, I mention all this to point out that I didn't come across anything, basically. There, there, right. were, there were occasional frame rate drops when the action got a little bit hot and steamy. But So you're saying, basically you're saying those other people are liars, right? A hundred percent, yeah. Right, good. Hundred percent. Just make sure we're on the same page. But like, here's here's the important question: Mass Effect One, um, like, is it is it any different? Have they changed? Because that's the one they've done the most work on, right? So that's why I played it. Like I've I've mentioned on here before that uh, I didn't play the original Mass Effect. I played it via that little comic book that you could play at the start of Mass Effect 2 when Mass Effect 2 came out. Yeah, it's not it's not quite the same thing. It's not it's not ideal. No, it's not ideal. You do miss certain little touches. Is the combat different? Like well you see I can't, I can't tell you exactly because I haven't played the original Mass Effect but from talking to people who have oh, okay. from talking to people who have it's like not really. It's a bit shinier. They've changed the UI to make it more in line with the sequel. Oh, when they talked about it it sounded like you know it's it's basically going to be the combat experience from Mass Effect 2, which is sort of substantially different. I mean, yeah, I, I can't compare it exactly like for like with the original. Right. But I can say that it sort of plays like a game from 2007. Okay, right. Like, do you know, this is a remaster. It's not a remake. Like, it's it's yeah. it's a bit awkward and fiddly when you shoot. The cover is unreliable. The map is absolutely... Oh, it is terrible. <laughs> Mm. And you know, like story wise, like our our just dialogue and character wise, some of the delivery is a bit OTT. The Paragon Renegade system is, you know, in hindsight, like going back and playing it now, it's like this is it's very black and white, and you sort of like there are zero shades of grey. However, it is still Mass Effect, and its world building is exceptional, and it's even with the delivery that is sometimes over over the top. Yes. It's power to make you feel something for these characters and these stupid manky aliens is maybe the best in games. Mm. And their control, Bioware's control over their plot is fantastic. Like it does, I don't know, maybe they've covered this in documentaries and whatever else. I'm not sure. But just it, like it really does seem like they weren't making it up as they went along, you know, Mm. like going back and playing the first eight or nine hours of Mass Effect, like the way that they're introducing concepts like the Shadow Broker very early on or the Rachni or whatever else. And I know the main, they mainly pop up in one, but it's just, yeah, their, their plotting is, is terrific. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I, 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 I think Mass Effect 1 is a little underrated. 
because everyone's sort of nuts for for two. But I think one does like introduce you to this world at a pretty good pace. I love the opening. The, the opening couple of hours, first couple of hours of Mass Effect One are, are pretty strong, I think, in terms of like giving you a villain you want to go after and yeah, um, you know, establishing you. Like you meet the. In my memory, I haven't played this one yet. Um, like you meet the crew quite fast. As somebody who came into the series with Mass Effect Two and where a new squad mate is a big deal. Here, it's basically you walk around the Citadel and you're like, all right, Rex, want to be friends? Yeah, cool. Garrus, want to hop in? Yeah, why not? Mm. Like it's very, it, it just, it gets you in quite quickly and just goes, here's your squad, go have fun. I mean, who, who, who wouldn't want to be squad mates with David Suchet? I mean, <laughs> he'd be, I mean he'd, he'd settle all disputes anyway if there were any mysteries of sorts. I suppose this is something maybe more for console players. Because, I don't know, like with mods, could you make the old games look like the Legendary Edition? Perhaps? I mean, I often feel like in, in, in these sort of redos and remasters, whatever, PC does often get the short end of the stick. I think I'm probably going to play this. If I play it, I'm probably going to play it on Xbox. Um, just because I, I don't know, I associate the series with the console experience sitting on the couch. It's quite cinematic. Um, I play it with a pad. Um, had good fun with it back on 360. So, If you're not one to mess around with mods uh, and you, you play on PC, like I suppose this is the best way to play it because it has controller support, which I know is like only like a, a minor or well, like a major thing, but like a small thing you wouldn't think of mm. going back to the first one. Uh, but like, yeah, this one, it, it makes it easy for you to just jump in and play. So I get that. But if you do like customize, uh, customizing your games, then sadly, this doesn't really have an awful lot for you. But yeah, it's Mass Effect. Mass Effect is a very good series. There's some very good games in there. So, you know, I, I like I, I, I've played about eight hours. I will probably play more. It's a shinier version of the old old games. Crack on. Get it if you want, children. Matthew, you haven't been playing Mass Effect, uh, but a series that, you know, maybe is as storied in some cases. It's been going on for quite a while anyway, at least. Uh, you have been dabbling in that Assassin's Creed DLC. Um, so I'm just going to say, for starters, this footage is actually on the Xbox Series X. Because, <gasps> well, that's where I played Assassin's Creed originally. So with all my character and everything. Uh, and so, and then I only use the on console capture. So it's a little bit, lo- it's a little bit low res and uh, artifacty. So apologies for that. Um, but the same contents there. So it should be fine. Um, this is, uh, listen, it's more Assassin's Creed. Um, <laughs> if, if it sure is. If uh, if you got to the end of Assassin's Creed Valhalla and you spent a hundred hours um, clearing out every region and finding all the mystical stone henges and um, fighting all the legendary wolves or whatever, um, you get to go to Ireland and do a whole lot more. Um, quite a chunk more, actually. It's big. Uh, it's it's like the the island itself is is split into sort of th- three or four regions, sort of three big regions and small regions, which are kind of like the regions in the main game. Like they're quite, you know, that each one's got loads of treasure to find and, and um, little side missions and some new activities um, like these, uh, like uh, druid fights where you light these torches and then it all sort of gets a bit sort of, um, sort of you have hallucinations and you have to fight all these sort of demonic druid characters. Um, so just on a purely like, if you if you know if you had exhausted somehow Valhalla, um, here's just a load more. Um, wrapped up with a story about Ava going to Ireland. Turns out uh, her cousin or something is the king of Dublin, <laughs> um, uh, as you cool. do, and she yeah. she goes over and um, meets figures from Irish history, which I'm going to put my hand up and say I know absolutely nothing about. You might know. I don't know. Did you get taught this in school? Uh, well, like it kind of figures King, King from folklore. Fla- King Flan. I assume he's real. <laughs> <laughs> if he was real, 
<laughs> we we had we had a, f- a few kind of kings in our in our uh, in our past. Yeah. yeah, it's the High King of Ireland, apparently. Like, I, well, I was going to ask you because uh, you know, being and this may shock some listeners and viewers, but like being Irish myself, uh, I. When media is set in Ireland, I will have a greater interest in it yeah. purely out, out of a sort of a morbid curiosity because a lot of these, you know, media is created by Americans and stuff and mm. their perception of what Ireland is would be a lot different to mine, for example. Yeah. So, like, everyone you meet, do they greet you by saying, Top of the morning to you. Uh- but no, I believe you have referred to this as paddy whackery. Paddy whackery, indeed, yes. Uh, no, it's it's mercifully short on that. Um, okay. <laughs> there's there's a lot of um, it, obviously a lot of people speaking in Irish accents. Some of them I, I like more convincing than others. I'd say, um, like it's it's pretty soft and gentle. Like it, it's it's all very like easy to pass. I'm not saying that I struggle with the Irish accent. <gasps> what I'm saying is it's very, like, clean, polite Irish accents, if that makes sense. Right, okay. A lot of posh D foreheads. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I, so the thing I would say with this is, like, there's, there's not there's not much, like, massively new about it. There's nothing that really separates it, and it really does feel just like a chunk more Valhalla. I mean, the problem with the game is that you know, it only has like a limited number of like gameplay mechanics it can work with. So, you know, by the end of Valhalla, you've seen everything it can do. And now it's just trying to kind of repackage them. So, you know, there's a bit where you go and storm a castle. There's, you know, a bit where you have to sneak around and free a hostage. There's a bit where you have to go into a cave to get a key and a treasure. Like everything you've seen is just endlessly remixing the same 10 mechanics. And like they're fun enough as a stealth game, but it's it's like they haven't really added anything new to it. I would say, you know, in in, in right. and and this was this was a problem too. I thought with um, Valhalla's uh, not Valhalla Odyssey's DLC, which would kind of took you to mythical realms, and there they balanced out the fact that you'd kind of seen everything the game had to offer by just putting it in these like mad fancy landscapes. It was a bit more like the Immortals Phoenix Rising. They were like you know, you were literally in the world of the gods and they were pretty kind of, you know, they had the kind of crazy scale to them, um, you know, which obviously helped because then you were like, well, okay, it's more of the same, but it's somewhere interesting. Here, like, Ireland has a sort of topography that's different to, you know, it's a bit more kind of craggy. There's a lot of kind of like some some very nice like rolling hills. But again, like you could probably show me screenshots from this and other places in Valhalla and I wouldn't be able to tell you what what which was from which. You know, okay. It's not that different. Um, the big thing it has is the druid angle, which is like there's there's this sort of druid cult um, that comes with like a little network of druids you have to assassinate. Uh, Allah kind of hunting the order in the other games, um, so it kind of does that again. Also, the druids have like this funky gas which makes you hallucinate when you fight them. So the Ooh. druid enemy types are a bit more kind of supernatural. You know, they they are just people, but they can, like, breathe fire and, like, you fight an actual werewolf. I didn't know you had werewolves in Ireland. Uh, (laughs) One or two. But I, I, um, because, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, when it comes to these hallucinations, are we talking Scarecrow and Batman? Like, kind of like... what you can see right now. It's like, it all goes a bit yellow and they've got glowing eyes. So, you know, it's not like you know, you're whisked away in some other world. It's still the world. It's just a bit yellow and spooky and you know, the enemies can do sort of supernatural things. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And that's fine. Like, it's a different enemy type, but, you know, you've kind of seen it after a couple of hours. And like I say, there's like three quite big regions of this. Um, Is it nice to go back to Valhalla? Like, I know I, you, I like, you quite like, like it. I find it very easy to play. Like, it's a good kind of like, you can kind of pop a, a podcast on in the background and collect things while you're chomping around. You know, I like the vibe of it. I like the, you know... It, it, you know, it's it's one of my preferred versions of the Ubisoft map cleaning thing. You know, I like going around ticking off all the gold from the map. You know, there's some little puzzly bits. There's some, you know, there are some sort of moments of little striking kind of beauty of, you know, you go across a hill and you see like a rainbow or whatever, and you're like, oh, that's nice. Mm. Um, it just, 
it really it just doesn't have a lot to sort of separate it out really um you know it felt like i guess actually the big mechanical thing they have added is this you're sort of setting up this trade network across ireland by um going to like uh kind of like farms or places that formerly made sort of produced kind of cloth or books or whatever and you have to clear out the enemies from there then you have to go and find the deed to the place to kind of take over it and then you can invest money in that to kind of increase production of these resources they then get sent back to dublin and from dublin you're kind of like using those resources to buy kind of rewards and things so really it's all done in menus i mean to call it a management game it would be very very generous i mean it's it's basically like if you've played valhalla it's what you do in the hunting hut but kind of turned into like applied to this sort of like retail network that you're building in ireland um but it's meant to give the game this sense of like you've gone to ireland to you know it's it's this sort of uh land of opportunity compared to England where you can make stuff out, you know, there are like, you know, precious resources to tap. And that's kind of the, okay. that's kind of the vibe of the story. Um, but really it just, it just involves kind of going into a place. And once you've bought the three upgrades to each trading depot, or whatever they're called, um, you know, your relationship with that place is done. It's not like you have to go back there and like manage it or like protect it or whatever. It's just a, you know, it's it's just more ticking stuff off a list. It's just another way to dress up the kind of in-game economy. But, you know... It's more Assassin's Creed. It's more Assassin's Creed. Part of me was happy to have an excuse to go back. You know, I've got this character. I've leveled it up through 100 hours of playing Valhalla. I've unlocked all this stuff. <clears throat> it's quite nice to have something to do with them. You know, it's quite nice to take that character and absolutely batter some druids. Um, there's just not a lot of... Um, you know, big Irish energy. They do say um, the Irish, what's the Irish word for cheers? Oshlaunter. Yeah, they say that. Uh, and it says in brackets, cheers. And they say <laughs> what you say at the end of the, what sounds a bit like what you say at the end of this podcast. Or do they say slán or walia? Well, they just say slán. Slán. By itself, which is like goodbye, S- right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Alice, <laughs> deputy editor Alice Bell, was saying that she played a little bit and one of the characters was uh, talking in English, I believe, and they said, blah, 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 it, it, it will be great crack. And in the subtitles, it crack, it said brackets, fun or something. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does do that. <laughs> but it does, it does that, with, it does that with, with like keywords throughout Valhalla as well, like there's Viking terms where they're like, you know, whatever and it'll say this mead means. alcohol <laughs> uh but uh good well i'm glad you you enjoyed revisiting assassin's creed has this made you more more or less excited for say like future because i think there is more there's more dlc on the way isn't there i believe yeah so you go to france as well but i just imagine it'll be like this it'll just be more more of this more green I don't know. Hills. It's, it's, it's a massive thing i mean i've been like I think I've seen other people say that it will like take twenty hours to do it all, which is like pretty vast um, by these things standards. Um, there is, yeah. I don't know. I just thought the I thought the Odyssey DLC was a bit more s- sort of spectacular, and it helped disguise the fact that it was quite repetitive. Um, yeah, it's uh, I don't know, like I, I think I've got a bit of Stockholm syndrome with. Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Like I played so much of it that like I, I kind of invested in it and I can't sort of see its faults necessarily. I'm just like, oh, okay. You know, when you've collected 90% of a game world, you just feel compelled to get the last 10. Otherwise that previous 90 was a waste of time. Um, which isn't probably a healthy relationship. Um I don't know. Like I just m- more than anything, I hope somehow i don't know how they do it or what this would look like that the next assassin's creed just has a bit more depth mechanically that it can stretch out and fill 100 because the problem is it's 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 got enough ideas for like a 20 hour game but you repeat them endlessly for 100 hours and yeah. that's a problem with a lot of open world games like once you reach a certain level you've got the you know you know you max the character out or you max out your understanding of those mechanics you're like eh, you know this 
Sorry to keep going on about this. In there is the in the main campaign of Valhalla, there's a bit where you go to America and for some bullshit reason you can't take like any of your equipment with you. So you basically go in and, and you're sort of stripped. You, you know, you have nothing. And then it's a sort of quite a self-contained area, but within it, you have to kind of go through the kind of power arc of the kind of rest of the game again, if that makes sense. Right. So you're kind of equipping, you have to kill some sort of smaller animals. But actually, the sudden drop to like being vulnerable for a couple of hours, having to kind of work your way through the food chain again to kind of have any kind of standing in it. But that felt like a, that felt like quite a fun take on on the, like the same what was the same mechanics set, but they kind of come at it from a slightly different angle. And I kind of wish they'd done a bit more of that in the deal. Like DLCs feel like a place where you can be a bit more experimental. Um, oh, I tell you, what you do get you get a. Um, you guess you can summon. You get a new special attack where you can summon an Irish wolfhound. Ooh! Um, but I mean, it's it's just like a reskin of the the wolf you can summon back in England. So, oh. mm. you know. But yes, I'm glad you you've been enjoying revisiting Assassin's Creed um, to a point, I suppose. Uh, a video game that is very different is the Invisible Hand. Right. So it's one of the more compelling and very odd games that I've played in a while. Mm. So, so it's, it's a first person game mm-hmm. uh, where you play as a stockbroker okay. that has been, they've been brought onto this company called Ferios. And your goal is to make as much money as you can between the hours of nine o'clock and six o'clock every day. And there are points where you will be in competition with other people who work at Ferios and uh, your, your objective will, will be like, you know, reach X amount of dollars before they do in a set number of days. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's kind of oddly compelling. I played a lot more of it than I thought I was going to. Like, I, I probably put in a good four or five hours. But mm-hmm. like, you know, I think a lot of us have a very very, very basic understanding of how the stock market works thanks to things like the big short. You know, you you buy the stocks when they're low, you sell when they're high for profit, you can short company stocks, so on and so forth. I still don't understand shorting even after watching the big short. I I understood like enough to enjoy the big short. (laughs) But anyway, the the more you play of this game, the more options open up to you because it's not just about... um, buying and shorting is uh, you, you can actually like fudge the markets as well and artificially raise or lower a company stock by using uh, lobbyists. But at the same time, then you have to be careful because if you abuse that power, let's say you inflate the prices of like weapons because you've put, you've lumped on weapons and you'll benefit. Uh, yeah. If, if you do that, and you're using like loads of people, then you'll actually raise the suspicion of the general public. And you might end up in a situation where you'll either lose your job or you might get the attention of the cops. Is it like simulators? Does it, script, does it, like, does it feel like it can go either way or does it feel scripted like a visual? It's not like a visual novel. No, no, no. It, it, it totally feels like it can go whatever way. Yeah, no, it, it, because... Because what you have to do basically is you have to observe the markets. Like you have, when you're sitting at your desk, you have this little social feed where you'll see tips uh, about, you know, dark roast coffee is on the rise. Lump on that. So you'll be like, oh shit, right, okay, I better do that quick. Uh, But then you have to sort of decipher who is reliable and who isn't. And what is reliable information and what isn't? And a lot of that does come down to, like, this is a social feed, so these posts will have little hearts, little likes next to them. And it's typically whatever has the most likes is the correct thing. You should do that. But there's also this business newsletter or paper thing that you can have a look at most mornings. And sometimes you have access to this dodgy, dark web application called Geistnet. That is story related. So you, you don't always have access to that. That depends on where you are in the actual game, I suppose. Mm. It, yeah, it, it, it sort of sucked me in. Like, I'm, I'm a very nervous gambler anyway. 
So playing around with fake money is quite tense. <laughs> I suppose I right. found uh, like I, if I put anything above like a fiver on a match or something, I'm like, oh no, 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 I can't. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be freaking out. What are we, how are we going to eat tonight? So if you do put like 50k on a drinks comp on like a water company, aqua firma or whatever, and then you see, you look to your social feed and you see like P. Bateman says like, oh, water prices are plummeting. Pull out. You're like, oh shit. And and that added with the playing against an opponent, it 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 can actually be like relatively exciting, you know, as exciting as looking at kind of numbers and going up and down are. Um, mm. you know, so some people are into that, but I've kind of mentioned it a few times. The story aspect, it isn't subtle, and for that reason, it does fall a little bit flat, but. At the same time, without it, I don't think I would have bothered playing it because that was the hook to get me in the door. So, like, without spoiling things, this game, you know, it's not celebrating capitalism. It's using it as its tool to, you know, criticise it, I suppose, uh, because, you know, you're playing with money. Your goal is to get as rich as you can. But it does the whole, like but what if your actions are, like, how are your actions affecting others around the world? It reminded me a little bit of Papers, Please. Right. Uh, like, do you know, that that type of angle where you're playing and then you're just playing this little stock market game and a story is, comes into play and you're learning of this country that's being affected by what you're doing, your movements on the market. It's not horrendous or anything. It's, it's just, it's a little bit clunky. Money bad. It's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fair. Uh, but it's still, at the same time, really enjoyed it, actually. The Invisible Hand, quite enjoyable. Matthew, you have been not playing on the stock markets, but in a, a post-apocalyptic Tokyo, I believe. Yes, I'm playing some Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne HD Remastered. That's, that's a mouthful which is an HD remaster of a 2003 PS2 JRPG in the Shin Megami Tensei series. Are you familiar with this series? I am, Matthew. I am a number one fan after really enjoying Persona 5 Strikers earlier this year. Yeah, it's like, it's a series I've played, like I've dabbled with on like DS and 3DS from my time in those magazines, but I've never really thrown myself into into one of these games. Um, Shin Megami Tensei being the mainline series of which Persona is a spin-off of, if that makes sense. What's kind of interesting about this one is that, and this may sound like really obvious because it, you know, because Persona is the spin-off, it's, you know, is arguably the, like the evolution of the idea, I would say. Um, this is... This feels like playing a bit of a Persona game. As in not, you're not getting the whole Persona experience. Yeah, so it doesn't have, it's like a, if you had a Persona game that was only the dungeons and didn't have like the social aspect. Okay. Um, this is kind of that. There's a much bigger focus on um, the kind of collecting the monsters, kind of capturing the monsters to, to join your side, you know, in that, in your party, you have the, the, the main uh, protagonist, the Demi Fiend, he's called. And um, <laughs> and you capture the other monsters, or rather, you kind of lure them to work for you, um, and then they become your three other party members. So you know it's a bit like a sort of Pokemon human ter- teaming up with three Pokemon, and then going into lots of turn based battles. So the monsters are much more like front and center than they sort of are in Persona, where they obviously have the kind of human avatars that they kind of act through or personas. Yeah, so like, and, and maybe that feels about you know, is that a criticism? Like, d- d- sort of depends depends on how well you kind of gel with the game. Like, yeah. if you come to this of like, oh, I fucking love Persona, I think you may feel it's like quite bare bones compared to that. I mean, story wise, it kind of whips along. You know, we're talking about sort of forty hours as opposed to kind of a hundred hours of Persona. Uh, I'm led to believe it's quite darker than Persona. Is that? Yeah, it is. I. <laughs> It's strange because the demons themselves are the same. Like it has the same kind of monster pool as the Persona games. So they're quite sort of silly, colourful creatures. And they themselves are very characterful. And I would say that they kind of lift the tone of it into something slightly jollier than it could have been. I mean, 
it does end with the end of the world, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which is obviously like a bleak place to start. Basically, this you sort of off you've got this little prologue, it's about twenty minutes, and then you know the world is basically destroyed and becomes Toku becomes the kind of um, this sort of hellish wasteland where like a new society is going to be born. Like in order to birth this new society, you have to sort of destroy the world first. And then the rest of the game is basically like the battle between different ideologies to be the, the new world that gets reborn. And you as the kind of player character, you go around kind of meeting the, the people who kind of you know represent the different kind of viewpoints of the world, the different kind of leaders. And, you know, there's an element of like talking and teaming up with different people. There's multiple endings based on like which of the, which of the worlds you sort of see to, you sort of see, you know, come to life. Um, based on kind of conversations you have. But mainly it's like a super traditional 3D JRPG, overworld map, dungeons, random battles, like constantly as you sort of walk around. Very, li- There's actually very little in the way of like cutscenes and story. Like you can talk to monsters, you can talk to some of the devils and some of the ghosts of like the former occupants of Tokyo who add a bit of like color to it. But really it's it's very kind of like, I'd say it's very focused on the kind of the action, the kind of grinding through dungeons, collecting monsters. So it's it's persona without like a lot of the kind of the characterful cladding around it. But that's okay. I I, I actually think that's okay because I mean, if anything, it made me like appreciate. I, I like the battle system. I like I like the battle system in Persona, which has similarities in that it's based on elemental weaknesses. Um, the whole sort of thing here is that every time you hit an elemental weakness of an enemy, you gain like another half turn. Every time you hit a critical attack, you gain another half turn. So in theory, you know, you, you have four turns for your, you know, in your, in your go, there are four actions for your four monsters. But if you hit people with the right combination of stuff, you can double it up to eight. So you can actually, you know, strategically kind of do quite a lot of damage. Likewise, um, if monsters attack you and and if they hit you with something that you're uh, not vulnerable to elementally, they lose a turn. If you dodge their attacks, they lose a turn. So if when everything's going well in this game, you're piling up extra moves. They're not being able to lay a hit on you because they're missing and you can absolutely rinse them. And that's quite fun. That's actually, as a, as a core rhythm of the turn-based battling, it, you really get to wallop people, which I like a lot. I mean, the flip side to that is that's all true of the monsters attacking you as well. Like if they hit your elemental weaknesses or land a critical hit, they get another turn. Um, if, if they dodge your attacks, you lose turns. So like while you can steamroll things, the downside is that it can all come back to haunt you and a monster can absolutely steamroll you. So, you know, it's surprisingly how fast things can go to shit if you've got the wrong combination of enemies. Well, it was famously difficult, apparently. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I'd say that difficulty is more from the fact that, you know, as I just said, like they can pile on you, they can hit you far quicker than you could imagine if things go wrong. I mean, the whole thing is you basically just have to get ahead of that, and you know, once you've been in a dungeon for a bit and you see the kind of monster elemental types that are in there, you know, not to have any, you know, not to have people in your party who are weak to those elements, you know. It's interesting as well, like this this whole focus on like dodging and evading means that like buffs for like agility and defense buffs actually feel like way more pertinent here than they tend to in JRPGs. Like I often feel that like a lot of, and this is a generalization, but in a lot of JRPGs, a lot of the kind of support magics, it feels like they only really come into play in like very tough boss battles or very specific like you know, you can undermine this boss by like negating this particular power that he has. Where here, it feels like those powers are actually really, really powerful. You know, like if you can increase your whole team's agility, you know, or defend, you know, they're dodging attacks left, right and center and your turns are just accumulating because of that. So it has really got something going for it. It's definitely got a rhythm of its own. And like, if you get into that and if you get hooked on the kind of collecting the monsters, um, you know, playing it strategically, making sure you've got the right party makeup at different times. You know, there's definitely enough here to keep you occupied and keep you happy. I was, I was really, really digging it. Um, which isn't necessarily something I take away from Persona. I think because there's just a bit more 
like pizzazz to persona you don't always you don't always dig into and also persona 5 is like very easy you don't necessarily like have to dig deep into the systems behind it uh this puts those systems front and center and they hold up really really well um and you know i like the monster design i do like the tone of the game like the contemporary tokyo thing you know it's not just relying on quite tired RPG tropes or or weird fantasy stuff that I'm not necessarily into it does feel old. I will say, not a very sexy port. Right? Yeah, because I, I was going to ask you about the port. Like, they added a new difficulty, like a sort of an easy difficulty. I know that, and that that's an absolute piss take. That difficulty. Oh, is it? That difficulty is actually quite misjudged. In that, there's definitely a place for an easier difficulty in this game. Like, it's reasonably stiff on normal. I would say. Um, but that easy, basically, like it negates all those systems, so you don't really have to worry about okay. the, the weaknesses or whatever. You can just you can just steamroll everything just by basically auto attacking. You level up so fast that you get ahead of the curve. I would say it's an example of like a bad easy mode in that it it kind of guts what makes the, the combat system interesting. Of course, if you just want to play it for the story, by all means, bang it on, rinse it. That's fine, but. I don't know. I, I I think it's I think it's a little uh, it's a shame. There's not something between easy and normal um, for for people who want that more like lighter experience, but still want to kind of engage with it. And this also has voice uh, like fully voice, voice acting. But again, like there's not a lot of cuts. It's not like Persona where you're spending all the time with these characters. Like. It's kind of, it's very old school. You go through a dungeon, there's a cutscene at the end of the dungeon. You go to the next dungeon, there's a cutscene at the end. That's how it deals out its story. It's very like bit by bit by bit. Um, you know, it's well voiced act, fine. That's fine. But I wouldn't say, you know, in this day and age, saying something's got voice acting, doesn't, it's not, you know, <laughs> maybe it would have been sexier in 2003. But here you're like, yeah. Um, technically, it's kind of weird because it's quite an old, sparse game. So having this big HD remaster of it, there's not actually like a lot going on with it. You know, you could say like Persona is almost like a triumph of like art style over like, you know, actual yeah. graphical complexity. I, this doesn't quite have that style. Like it's, it's very bare. I, I find it more often more bland than anything. Um, also, and I, I'm like, I'm pretty sure this isn't just my computer being an asshole, but it's... Um, it's like capped at 30 frames on PC, which is baffling. Oh, for something really? that looks this. Yeah. That's odd. I can't, I don't really know what that's about. Uh, but it just naturally, it moves like a PS2 game still. Like it just doesn't, I don't, yeah, I, that's odd. <laughs> um, considering it's like, you know, everything else that Sega and Atlas have brought to PC recently, you know, they may have not been like absolute crazy polished you know they haven't done much to them but they play you know they 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 play nice on quite low power pc yes. you know i'm thinking of like yakuza the peer persona 4 port last year um this doesn't have that and also it's like way more expensive than those like a lot of those games came to pc and they're like 20 quid for like the yakuza 0 or 20 quid for persona 4 this is like 50 quid Woo-hoo! Which it's 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 their I would say it's their least sexy port and it's their most expensive port and that that for me I have got beef with that um, yeah. I don't think that's I don't think that's particularly compelling I think it's quite misjudged um, given that it's an older game given that it just has so much less going on in it then I know I know that sounds like a stupid kind of criteria to judge things like oh there's less in this than there is in Persona but. It feels less sophisticated, and yet I'm paying a lot more for it. Ah. So, would you be inclined to tell people to maybe, you know, even if you are a Persona fan and you want to see where the series began or whatever, would you be like, eh, maybe leave it off? Or yeah, I would say that like it's a shame. Like I've, I've, I have really been enjoying this. Like genuinely, I really like the combat. I kind of like the vibe of it. I like the weird demon designs. I just think that it's like. It would be much easier to recommend for twenty quid. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Wait for the like, sale. Yeah, wait for a sale. I just don't really know what. Like, it's so different. The strategy behind this is so different. From you know, they're treating it like a new game because it's this HD remaster. But really, it's less technically impressive than Persona Four, which itself really wasn't anything special, and was cheap to reflect that. Uh, 
I, I yeah, but was it per- Persona was like, yeah, that was like twenty, like yeah, fifteen twenty odd when that. Yeah, I just I don't really get it. Like, I just yeah, it's weird. I mean, it's, it's you know an interesting game. Like, it's widely held to be like it's the good intro game to Shin Megami Tensei. You know, it, there are loads of these games. Like traditionally, they're like um, sort of first person perspective dungeon crawlers a bit more you know much kind of old, like older feeling i would say um so this one being in 3d and everything it's, it you know, feels a bit, a bit sort of uh sexier a bit more kind of glamorous um you know a bit more sort of accessible and friendly on that front um yeah it's uh, i'm very conflicted on this one like I, I had a really good time with it but it's also hugely flawed and a bit more of a, definitely more of an acquired taste than persona but like, weirdly, it has got me interested in playing more of them. You know, like, I want to go back to the DS and 3DS ones and, like, dig into them because hmm. it's, uh, it's got a central loop. It's, it's compelling. Yeah. I, I, like, I do like turn-based combat. If for all the grind, I, I like turn-based combat systems, especially when you can, like, absolutely rinse them, which this one is kind of built around. So, yeah, I just, I sh- like... Bit of a bit of a weird port for quite an interesting game. Yeah, yeah. Probably the least interesting part of clothing that people wear on a daily basis. Right. Oh my god, these segues are for the ages. Outstanding, aren't they? Our socks. And I recently played a video game called Sock Venture. Uh, where you don't play as a sock. Yeah, I know it seems odd, but you don't. Uh, you play as somebody that I checked the Steam page beforehand because I want to, I was like, are you, what are you? Are you a sock? Are you, what, what are you? You're it just the Steam page says you're, you're like, su- you're superhero. <laughs> so I don't know. But either way, uh, socks are still very important in this world because you are searching the the innards of a washing machine looking for a child's socks. This washing machine has become cursed. Right. It swallowed all the socks. That's all you need to know. It doesn't really matter because this game lives and dies on its levels. So, yeah, it's a platformer where you have to deal with, you know, lasers, razor blades, whatever it is, um, as you go from left to right often. And as you play through the game, you're opening up new skills like wall jumping, double jumping, dashing. And before long, you realise that you're playing a very colourful, cartoony version of Celeste. And I mean, that's what they're going for, at least, because this is, this is attempting to be your hardcore platformer where lasers are shooting around all over the place and spikes are shooting up from the ground and all that. but. And like, ugh, I'm not trying to be a bastard, but like, like the reason I say it's attempting the Celeste style platformer purely is because I do think it's a, it's a touch forgiving. You will die. I'm not saying you're not, you're not, never going to die. You will die. And I do want to point out as well that they, they're very good at like when you die, getting you back into the game really quickly, which is paramount in a video mm. game like this. But to get back to comparing it to Celeste, which I understand is very unfair because I think Celeste is one of the best games of the last few years. Like, Celeste are just Twitch 2D, good Twitchy 2D platformers mm. are, are tough, but never unfair because that's what, like, that's what makes or breaks these types of games. They need to be challenging, but every death needs to be the fault of the players, not of the game. And yeah, Sock Venture is just it's not a complete piece of piss or anything, but it is just lacking a bit of oomph in its challenge. Right. You sort of get into a, a rhythm. It's just, a, it's a bit formulaic. Jump over the blade, hang on to the wall, dash to the other platform. And, and that's even as new elements are, are being introduced. And, you know, I suppose, again, to unfairly compare it to Celeste, like, you know, a zero heart in this story, like... <laughs> Like you're you're going around chasing socks, but whatever. It, it again, it lives and dies on its on its levels. It's just yeah, it's it's a bit kind of uninspiring, really. Mm. It's it, it's it's completely adequate. But I did want to mention it because I, I I played a bit of it and I was like, you know, it's fine. It's it's all right. So yeah, that's sock venture. Uh, so those are the games that we have been playing over the last seven days. So now. 
It's time to test the knowledge of one another in something we like to call Mystery Steam Reviews. It's time for Mystery Steam Reviews. Yeah! Yes! Mystery Steam Reviews is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where I, Colin Mahern, and he, Matthew Castle, test the knowledge of one another via Steam Reviews that are a mystery. And listen up, right? Because the rules are as follows, but they have changed ever, ever, ever so slightly. So, both I and Matthew bring three Steam Reviews to the MSR Arena, but we omit the name of the game associated with each review. Our opponent must correctly guess the game attached to each review. One correct answer equals one point. While both of us have 90 seconds on each MSR, we both also have help in the form of three lifelines. These lifelines can be used at any stage during battle, and they also pause the 90 second timer. They can only be used once. And they are as follows, and this is the bit that's changed slightly. Publisher? Where the hot seat haver learns the publisher of the game. Second opinion, where a second review is given to the fiery chair sitter. And genre, where the genre of the game is revealed to the one with the warm arse. So yes, we ha have swapped out the much maligned, I like to think, underappreciated question uh, <laughs> for publisher because we acknowledge the fact that question when it was being used, uh, it wasn't really shedding much light. I'd... Maybe publisher will make things too easy. I don't think so, though. Well, it's, a, it's an ever-evolving rule set. Mm -hmm. uh, also, for people playing weak spot bingo, yes, there has been a change to to uh, <laughs> Mr. Steam Review rules, which I believe is on the bingo card. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that that's your housekeeping. Now, the other thing I need to mention is the theme, which is single-player video games with multiple playable characters. Now, right. that that isn't ga single player games where you get to choose the character. That is games where the game will, you know, you'll be playing as this character for 10 hours and then for the next two levels, oh wow, you'll be playing as another character or whatever. Uh so, Matthew, let's let's kick it off. Here yeah. is your first mystery steam review. I originally had a sword, then I had magic motorcycle chainsaws. And became Michael Jackson. That's from Jack. It is recommended 9.7 hours on record. And your time starts now. Right. I mean I mean instantly I'm thinking I'm thinking Devil May Cry 5. I'm not gonna lie to you. That's that's I mean magic motorcycle chainsaws. Don't let me be honest. Like that's that's that, surely that's that. I mean there's no other game with motorcycle chain. Is there a, a game where you, it's got three characters that you play as? Michael Jackson. Mm. The thing is, that Michael Jackson is saying like I don't necessarily know what that is, or I can't remember how that relates to Devil May Cry Five. But the motorcycle, because I have played through all that game, so. But the motorcycle chainsaws that is so Devil May Cry Five. I think that's got to overrule the Michael Jackson thing. So, yeah, I'm going to say, stop the clock. My final answer, Devil May Cry 5. Don't need to ask that man twice. Very confident you recognise motorcycle chainsaws. That's surely Devil May Cry. It's the Michael Jackson thing. You were like, don't remember that. Matthew, I can tell you that the correct answer is... Devil May Cry 5. Do you remember when Dante does his little dance towards the end of the game? Oh, he moonwalks. He moonwalks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very... Yeah, well, there we go. A, 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 nice, a nice start. Quite a generous review. I also point out to the people who think that I'm getting an easy ride of this. I don't think so. I've just got, like, a mega brain for this. And I mean that in a humble way. No, you're a wedding cake, Matthew. Embrace the wedding cake. Matthew, could I have my first Mystery Steam review, please? The third best game in the franchise. The story is amazing, and it's an amazing series finale. 
Apart from the repetitive tank fights, our hero gets pushed to his limits in this game, and it's amazing, <laughs> says Tokyo. Well, I say amazing a lot. Is it amazing? This is Tokyo. They recommend this amazing game after 35.8 hours on record. Okay, time starts now. So, I know it's amazing, but also it is the third best game in the franchise, so the other games must be absolutely incredible. Repetitive yeah. tank fights. Our hero gets pushed to the limit in this game and it is amazing repetitive tank fights that's the old clincher there and a third best game in the series so maybe that you know it might be the third best game in the series out of seven but i'm gonna have to think about this like it's a trilogy trilogy with tank fights where you're in a tank or you're controlling a character that is tank like Oh, I'm trying to think of either now. Um, your heroes, your heroes, amazing. The game is amazing. I mean, you could describe. Yes, it's a car. Is it a car? It's tank like. You could describe the Batman mobile as. The Batman mobile. <laughs> As like, <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, as yeah, I'm gonna say Batman Arkham Knight because there's loads of like that. The, the Batman mobile was very controversial. Batman Arkham Knight, yeah. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer, Chris. So you were hooked on the tank. Also, third best game in the franchise. Made you think this was a trilogy. It is a series finale. I mean, that would describe Batman Arkham Knight. It's definitely about the finale. But do the repetitive bat tank fights refer to the Batmobile? Batmanmobile. The Batmanmobile. <laughs> the correct answer is... Batman Arkham Knight. Yes! Get in. Because you, um, you played as Jason Todd, didn't you? Well, and lo lots of different people. There's a little bit where you're Commissioner Harley Gordon Quinn. as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I will say, for the people at home, I can't hear the sound effects this week, and it is definitely sapping the drama for me. <laughs> 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 like, having to go to total silence is like... Matthew, let's, uh, let's give you your second Mystery Steam review. Imagine if uh, Final Destination had pretensions of artistic merit, and that's from Rios... Rios, it is not recommended two hours on record. Your time starts now. Oh, sh Jesus. Final destination. So, people dying in accidents, but it has pretensions of artistic merit. So, a sophisticated game where people die from chain reactions, maybe. What the hell would that be? Hit me on with that publisher. Oh-ho! Uh, so... <laughs> This is exciting. Uh, so Matthew has used his publisher lifeline. Yeah. Uh, the publisher of this video game is Anna Perna Interactive. Oh, interesting. Anna Perna Interactive. So restarting the timer at one twelve now. Well, they've not made that many games. They're all a little bit like, ooh, <laughs> you know, all their games are a little bit. D -d 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 -d. A little bit, ooh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, a little bit like, ah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, oh, jeez. What are the Annapurna games? Uh, all I can think of is Gorigoa, and it's don't think it's that. Um, uh, hit me up with the genre. Oh, we're going to pause the timer at 36. Uh, so... <laughs> The genre of this video game is... Please don't be a D diddly D and a perna game, because that is a genre. <laughs> game. Um, it is, according to wikipedia.org, an adventure game. Oh, yes. I should an really know this. An adventure Anna game. Anna Perna. I, I will s I'm just going to jump in here and say, just for... Cl like, not an adventure game in a double fine... Or point and click okay. way. I'll give you that. Thank you. Right, That's restart fine. restarting the timer now. Uh 
Give me a second review. What? No, what? I, Pause in the time for 29 I, Matthew. I just can't. This is unprecedented. I have to I have to get I have to get this one right because I've used two. I can't have two clues and have no answer. Uh all right. <laughs> We're going all in. So, the second opinion of this. Yeah. It's a beautiful tale that follows the titular character as she returns to her family home. Their graveyard house with its boarded up rooms and melancholy half-finished design hides a secret. This family is tragedy incarnate. So oh, just, well, I'm restarting the timer. 29 seconds now. I mean, that's a super generous second review. I know what it is. I mean, that's what remains of Edith Finch. Is that your final answer? That is my final answer. I mean, god damn it, that cost me. That cost me. If I, why didn't I go for clue first? I would have got that from that clue. I forgot that was Annapurna. Adventure game, sure. So, all I could think of was Dora Gower. You went all in on that one there. Excitingly, getting to see what the publisher lifeline looked like in action. <laughs> uh, revealed Annapurna. It was an adventure game, but it was the second review that really clinched it for you. You've gone for What Remains of Edith Finch, and I can tell you, Matthew, that the correct answer is What Remains of Edith Finch. Ring. <laughs> I imagine it went. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> and you could have played just a, a cacophony of farting sounds and really undermined my moment, but I wouldn't know. <laughs> Matthew, could I have my second? Okay, second, yeah. Mystery Steam Review, please. This game caused a real earthquake in the gaming industry. After nine years, you can now play it again in a more modern form. Although she still has fun and looks much better, the tooth of time is still visible on her. This is great, God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> get, a look, get a look at this guy. Recommended 46.4 hours on record. Okay, time starts now. Okay, nine years is obviously important. Don't know exactly when this review happened, but still, this is odd. You can play it again now in a more modern form, although she still has fun. She still has fun. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking dream, man. Uh, right, I think you're just telling me this is a... Like, yeah, predominantly a, a female protagonist maybe you play as... Oh, no, I, I actually honestly think they're talking about the game as a she for no reason. Oh! Oh! Uh, shit, that's totally throwing me now. Oh, sorry. Um, this, no, no, this, one's, this one's a bit of a dud. Uh, that's... F uh, oh, no. Um, hold on. So what did it say? The game is blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm just going to have to pause the timer. Uh, can I have my second opinion, please? Okay. 50,000 players used to live here, now it's a ghost town. Our so-called publishers prostituted us to the microtransactions. They destroyed our optimization, the online economy, our nostalgia. Okay, restarting the timer now. No, that's uh, nine years. 50,000 players used to live here, now it's a ghost town. Oh, that's a reference that I'm not getting it. <laughs> um, oh, no. Yeah, and I, 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 I don't. Publisher. No. <laughs> oh God, I feel bad now. No, and so you should. Um, I, uh, just I don't know, the division. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel bad about that one. <laughs> Go on, put me up. Put a bullet in my head. Is, is that your final answer? Yeah, Chris, it is. The correct answer is Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered. Right. Okay. That was, was tough. I'm so. That was. I was I'm thinking. Looking at my hands up. That first review, actually. I'm looking at it now. I'm like. I was thinking because I, I, I was, I was like, going oh, yeah, Tomb Raider, and I was like, like, it caused a real earthquake because it's massive. Like Call of Duty was absolutely massive. Nine years, I mean, okay, it got remastered. I thought you might think down the remastered route. The last bit's a bit, it distracts you. From the clue, that's the famous line from the start of Call of Duty. X number of people used to live here, now it's a ghost town. It's talking about the, the go Chernobyl area. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, so that, was, that was shitty. 
Well, I appreciate that you recognise that it was shitty. That was that was bad. My bad. <laughs> anyway, uh, Matthew, on to cheerier topics. Let's see if you can get a clean sweep here. Um, oh, I don't want see- one. Because everyone will boo if I get it. <laughs> let's see if my... You should throw it intentionally. Uh, let's see if my review is shitty. Uh, so here is your third and final Mystery Steam review. It's a four-hour action game with more timed action scenes than actual scary moments. The cinematic factor is great, but honestly, there is no suspense. Game has, like, two puzzles. It's mostly a run-and-gun shooter. No subtlety at all. And that's from FT, FTG Bro. Uh, it is not recommended. 7.8 hours on record. Your time starts now. I mean, for starters, they say it's a four-hour action game, but they've played it for 7.8. I noticed that too, yep. <laughs> the cinematic fact is great, but honestly, there's no suspense. It's got like two puzzles. It's a short, short shooter game. It's a four-hour with timed action scenes. What the fuck does that Like, against the clock action scene? Like, you have to... Yeah, it's mostly run and gun. Short shooters tend to be long, longer than that. Like, uh, oh, I wish I had any of my clues. Can't believe I wasted them all on Edith Finch. Um, oh, tight. An action game with timed segments. Uh, and it's sure. Oh, I have no idea. Run and gun. You're running and just saying words from the review. Hopefully, it will spark something. It's quite cinematic. Cinematic run and gun. Time segments. It's not. Do- it's not do. <laughs> oh my god! I have to do it. <laughs> no. Oh, I've, got, I've. I've literally got no other game other than Doom in my head, and it's not Doom. Oh, the ultimate loss. Uh, like, like, quantum break. That's not the time set. Fucking doom. <laughs> doom. <laughs> so, there was a lot to parse in that review for yeah. our action game. It mentioned timed action scenes. Uh, it said, yeah, more action than scary, it said. Uh, yeah. There, are, there are like two puzzles in it, run and gun, blah blah blah. You've gone for Doom. <laughs> and I can tell you that the correct answer is Resident Evil Three. Oh god damn it! Will you play as Carlos for a bit? Oh, if I'd had my, if I'd had my publisher clue, oh, Capcom, I would have been straight it. on it. Maybe Redemption is on the cards here, and I might be able to get. Maybe Red Dead Redemption is on the cards. It could be. Is he trying to trick me? Oh dear, let's find out with my third Mystery Steam review. Funny blue suit man point at funny red suit man. Says the boy. They recommend it after 96 hours. <laughs> uh, Stand the timer No. Funny blue suit man point at funny red suit man. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I have quite a lot. Well... All right, then. Let's just start taking the, the boxes, pausing at 117. Matthew, because I'm like, yeah, could I have my publisher, please? Because it kind of sounds a bit yakuza e, but also, like, neither Majima or Kiru. I'm thinking of Yakuza 0, but they don't wear red suit or blue suit. Although their po- they're powers, they're... Go on. Uh, so this is, uh, apparently, this is published by Capcom. All right, well, it's definitely not uh, uh, Yakuza then. Could I have my genre, please? Uh, this is a visual novel adventure game. Ooh, dear. Okay, uh, restart the timer now. Visual novel adventure game, Capcom. A visual novel adventure game from Capcom. Oh, <laughs> shit. Um, the ones that you like. He wears a blue suit, doesn't he? Does the <laughs> the other... ones that you like. I don't, I know nothing about those games. 
I don't know what it's called. <laughs> Why are you even listen to me talking about it? Uh, the Ace Attorney is it, is it called the Ace Attorney trilogy or is it no? Is it the Phoenix Wright trilogy? Bollocks! <laughs> oh, if only you'd um, listen to me droning on. No, I get them mixed up. Which is Ace Attorney is the man with the hair and he points, and Phoenix Wright is the lad with the top hat. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> It's, it, I literally, it's like... <laughs> the lad with the top hat. Uh, the Ace yeah. Attorney, mm, is the Ace Attorney or the Phoenix Wright trilogy? The Ace Attorney trilogy. Is that your final answer? Yeah. So, you had Capcom, you had Visual Novel. This puts you squarely in the territory of the Ace Attorney games, but what is this one called? I would actually have given to you either way, it's Ace Attorney Trilogy. Yeah! Phoenix Wright does not wear a top hat. Does he not? Who wears a top hat? I mean, the game, the, the original game is called Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. Okay. So, uh, so hang on. So who's the guy with the, the quiff? Him, who's Phoenix Wright. Who it's not quiff, a, it's a who, reverse thing. He's got, like, hair that sticks back. Who wears a top hat? <laughs> um, Ap Apollo Justice's sidekick, Trucy, has a top hat, but I, that's quite a, that's, I'd say that's quite a deep cut for someone who doesn't know the series. Who am I thinking of? Maybe I'm just mixing Professor up with... Professor Layton. That's the lad! That's the lad with the top hat. <laughs> yeah. Mystery solved. Uh, <laughs> uh, right, okay, well i tell you what, if it wasn't for my shitty cod one I think you would have won that, so uh, Oh, well look, no, I, I, I No, I, no hard it, feelings it, though, no, right? No, 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 <laughs> no hard feelings, no All, all feelings are soft And good mm. And all that. Uh, so, that's another Mystery Steam Reviews done So now it's time to turn to your correspondence you lovely people and your burning questions. <laughs> yes, burning questions is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where indeed we turn to you, you lovely viewers and listeners, for your burning questions. You can email us at any stage throughout the week. Week spot at rockpapershotgun.com. Uh, so. Let's try and barrel through as many of these as we can. And we start off with the wonderful Mog, who uh, gave us 10 English pounds on the YouTube premiere of the last episode of The Week Spot. So thank you very much, Mog. You're an absolute star. And Mog asked... Sorry, I'm getting a case of the Windy Pops. Uh, Mog asked... You're getting are, a bit emotional there. Who are your favourite games developers and why? As always, great work, chaps. Thank you very much, Mog. So yeah, favourite games developers, Matthew. Because I feel, I don't know, saying like... I, actually, do you know what? Because it's in my head because we were talking about them earlier. You be, like... Ubisoft and it's like well that's kind of unfair because like Ubisoft Toronto make this one and Ubisoft Montreal make that and whatever else so like yeah I don't know is there any any developers coming to your I head I mean the obvious one's Nintendo for me I mean again it's a bit of a generalisation I don't love everything they do but you know or if, if you talk about individual developers um Nintendo EAD <laughs> yeah um I mean I, I, like, I like Catcom's vibe I like Capcom make what are in my head very video gamey video games, which I like. You know, I like Ace Attorney. I like Resident Evil. I like big, dumb, silly games that Capcom make. Um, I love the Yakuza team. They're good. Um, yes. Uh, Ryu Gagatoko. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like, I see, I'm trying to think of developers who, do, who like, haven't just done a series. I mean, yeah, I mean, like Samo, you know, uh, Samogo is a developer that I will always be interested in what they do because everything they do is feels quite different to the previous thing. Like they did Year Walk, which I think is one of my favorite horror games of the last 
God, that's probably like 10 years ago now, was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. D- Device 6, which I don't think came to PC, but uh, is an absolutely marvellous game. Sayonara Wild Hearts, which is a very sweet, like really, like you talk about a well kind of put together product. Like it is, everything is working in tandem, like visuals, like the the, the game itself, the music, it's really Really mm. terrific game. Um, so yeah, them. Uh, I like Lucas Pope for uh, Oberdin. Oberdin and um, Papers Please, yeah. Um, like other other like single games that have completely won me over to people. Uh, Outer Worlds, Mobius Digital. Um, like whatever that team does next, Outer Worlds DLC. Apparently, um, I'll be up for that. I don't know. <laughs> I I like so many develop. You know. It's, it's tricky. There's, there's not many who are. In, in, it's all tied to the game, you know. If every game I like, I guess in theory I like the developer. Is the, does that work? Like, yeah. I like hundreds of games. I mean, I whatever you want to call them, IDOS or slash Crystal Dynamics. Uh, like I think you know, Human Revolution. I think is great. I think the Tomb Raider reboot has its ups and downs. Yeah. Marvel's Avengers mm. uh, but I, I like if they announced their next game tomorrow I would be interested I'd be talking about it I'd be uh, yeah I would say if there's a developer who like not just I love their games but I like I love their vibe their deal and how they carry themselves like if I like the whole package I would probably say that like Larian jumps out you know I love Divinity Original Sin 2 um, really, really enjoying the early access of Baldur's Gate 3. I just like how they kind of carry themselves. I like the their sort of community focus facing thing. I like their weird little videos, their sense of humor. You know, in the times that I've met developers from Larian, they've all seen like super nice people. Um, you know, but th- there aren't many other developers I can think of where I like, like I just dig their whole kind of vibe. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's fair. I could probably think of more, but I should have prepped this before. So, sorry, Mog. <laughs> uh, Dog Diamond gave us five US dollars during the YouTube premiere. Thank you very much, Thank Dog you, Diamond. Dog. And Dog said, even though like I'll read their email out, but Dog did say in their YouTube super chat thing, my question for next week ran long, so I'm just going to email it. Keep up the good work. Thanks for distracting me from the work I should be doing right now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Doug. Uh, And Doug's email reads as follows. Recently, I was playing a JRPG that had a surprise time travel twist. Halfway through the game, you defeat the main bad guy, but one of your party members sacrifices himself in the process. The entire second half of the game is meant to be you going back in time, undoing your victory for a chance to save your friend. This is ridiculous. No way I'm going to risk the millions of lives of at stake just for a chance of saving one person. It'd be completely unethical. Instead, I decided that I had quote beaten the game and called it over with have you ever stopped playing a game before it was truly over not because it wasn't a good game but because you felt that the narrative arc had completed to your satisfaction also let me just say that I loathe time travel as a narrative device there should be warnings on games that use it so that right thinking people can avoid them properly Doug thank you very much Doug so uh, yeah a game that you got to a point in Matthew and you were like you know this makes sense. Imagine you watched, did you watch Dexter? Yeah. So I, so I always say to people, cause I'm one of the fools that stuck with Dexter until the very end. And I say to people, if they ever show any interest in watching Dexter, watch until the end of series four and then bow out and pretend that that is the, you have done Dexter. You've completed yeah, it. Quite, still quite an unhappy note to end on. <laughs> oh, very, no, like I'm not saying it's happy, but yeah. it's, but it is satisfactory. Like, mm. you know, you go on. I mean, if you're looking for a happy ending, then yeah, I suppose. Then maybe watch I mean, a different like, show. I, I struggle with this because I, I finished most things through. I mean, a, a game where like, uh, you know, uh, if you didn't progress in it and you were still having a good time and you could just kind of like freeze it as a happy moment, I'd say like maybe the first half of Final Fantasy fifteen when you're all bombing around in your car with your mates and you're all young and it, it becomes like more linear and cinematic after you get to a certain point, after you get to the, uh, I can't remember the city you go to, but you go to this city and then it 
it basically puts you on a kind of collision course with a bleak future after that point. Um, but that game is at its best when you're just dicking around in your car doing side quests. The fact that you can actually travel in time like back to that moment just to carry on, like that's that's how it kind of, you know, you can jump from the end of the game back into the earlier open world game, um, which is where I had the, my happy times of Final Fantasy XV. Um, but in terms of other things where I know, you know, see most of them through to the end. I'm um, typically the same. The, the, the best I could give you is uh, games where uh, it's like it games where the tr- the true ending is hidden behind collecting two hundred and fifty feathers in an Assassin's Creed or Batman. Actually, it, you're like you know you'll get the true ending if you collect all the Riddler trophies. No, I won't. The true ending is the one I get at the end of the game. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Like it's mm. no no way I'm doing that. So that's the only example I could give where I'm satisfied with that ending. Like, if something, yeah, if something hi- hides the true ending behind, however, like an insurmountable amount of uh, 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 collectibles, I'm like, no, nah, thanks. I'm all right. Um, and uh, let's do one, another one very quickly, just because, kind of run long. Uh, let's do... Uh, <laughs> what's I'm trying to find a quick question. Let's do Brymac. Brymac asked, uh, which early video game made you the most happy play, uh, made you most happy as most modern games don't seem to provide happiness? Love the weak spot. Brymac. That's a bit of a shame, Brymac. It's a lot of projecting cool, a bit. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of modern games that provide, well, depending on what you're into. Um, but yeah, so give me, in a sentence or two, Matthew. For you, Mario. For me, Sonic. End of. Move on. Uh, yeah. Early. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, if oh, well. you if you want to get your N- N64, Goldeneye, Smash Brothers, Perfect Dark, about as, as happy as I've ever been playing games. I don't go back much. I don't really go back to like NES and SNES. Um, some things I feel a little bit too crusty and old for me now. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, everyone who asked a question yeah we kind of ran a bit long and show and tell uh, but keep sending them in um, you can email us weekspot at rockpapershotgun dot com thank you very much as always, for listening, for watching, for consuming, however you consume. Uh, if you want to consume more, well, there are ways. Basically, uh, you can follow us on social media. I am at column underscore Ahern. Matthew is at Mr. Basil underscore Pesto. You can talk to some like-minded people on Discord, discord.gg forward slash rock, paper, shotgun. Uh, over on YouTube, you can watch the video version of the PC Gaming Week Spot, where you can like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, all that stuff. But if you prefer the audio version, subscribe to the PC Gaming Week Spot podcast via all your podcasting apps, including but not limited to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Pocket Casts, etc., etc. But for all of your PC gaming needs, keep it on Rock Paper Shotgun. Dot com. <sighs> Matthew, another week spot in the can. We will find video games to play and talk about for next week's show. And we'll all have a great time. I am sure of it. But Matthew, now is not a great time. Now, in fact, is my least favourite part of the show. Because this is indeed the part of the show where we must bid the listener, the viewer, adieu. So say goodbye, Matthew Castle. Goodbye. And say goodbye, Colin Mahern, Sloan, Guffold.